So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Alicia Butler-Pierre. Is that how I say your name properly? Oh, that was perfect. Excellent. That was perfect, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you. So Alicia ha- actually contacted me and she is um, the owner, CEO of a company um, called Equilibrium Inc., which has been going for about 17 years. They specialize in bu- uh, building well, operations management, um, specializing in sort of diagnosing and designing business infrastructure and processes. And so Alicia's just telling me before we got onto this podcast, you know, she works with businesses that have actually been around for a while. They've kind of grown. They don't have an issue with not having enough customers, but they've actually probably got too many customers and their business starts to fail because they're not able to keep up with that. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Alicia, welcome. Really great to have you here. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm really excited to be on your show. No, oh, thank you. And I know that you're on the other side of the world in Atlanta, Georgia. So I believe it's afternoon for you. So good afternoon to yourself. Yes. Thank you. And good morning to you. Oh, thank you. So I'm really excited because I know that um, certainly when we work with customers, it's one of the things that I do see is that businesses get to this point where they're growing really fast. They're mid mid-size, got a high growth um, mindset and drive, and they've got lots of customers coming in, but the wheels start to fall off. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can actually overcome that. Before we start, I always love to ask our guests for a professional and personal best just so we can get to know them a little bit better. So please, Alicia, tell us your story. My story. Oh, gosh. Well, my story, I guess a, a, I'll start in terms of career, career-wise. My story begins with me working as a chemical engineer, wearing a hard hat and steel toe shoes and personal protective clothing, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Um, and I, I worked at Monsanto. Uh, For those who may not be familiar with Monsanto, don't judge me for those of you who are, but but I worked in in several chemical plants and oil refineries. Monsanto was my very first job out of uh, university. Mm -hmm. And I, it didn't take me long, Deborah, to realize that I don't want to spend the next 20 to 30 years of my life being in an oil refinery or a chemical plant. And another thing I I came to realize was I didn't understand business. When I was working as an engineer, we had equipment would run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. But then there might be moments when we would be asked to cut production by 50% one day, shut down completely the day after that, and then run at full speed the following week. And it just seemed so manic, you know, what was driving those decisions? I didn't understand the business. I didn't understand the concepts of supply and demand and and how that can impact the amount of product that we were producing on a day-to-day basis. So I decided to go back to school. I went to business school. I was living in New Orleans, Louisiana, and it just opened my eyes to a completely new world. I have to be honest with you. I I no longer saw anything the same way. I would look at everything from the logo of a particular company, a, a place of business that I might frequent or, or, or patronize. I would look at the color scheme. I would look at how customers might flow through lines at, at a grocery store, at a market. It just... It was just so fascinating to me. And I decided to abruptly leave New Orleans. And it's a good thing that I did because I left in February of 2005. I relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, where I only knew one person at the time. But I just had this, you know, I just had this vision of making it big in Atlanta. And six months later, Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm a very devastating hurricane happened in New Orleans. And once I arrived in Atlanta, I really thought, and you couldn't tell me otherwise, that I was going to work at Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is headquartered here. I saw my, I would be able to leverage my newly minted MBA, my business degree, and combine that with my engineering background. And I was going to work in some type of a marketing research or analyst type position. And I must have searched for a job a good two months before. I just remember thinking to myself, this is This is such a soul crushing experience because you spend so much time 
applying for these jobs and you you're lucky if you hear anything back. Mm-hmm. And I just happened to be reading different articles, books, watching different documentaries at that time, Deborah, and everything seemed to center around this concept of the fact that we're all blessed with natural skills, talents, and abilities. Mm-hmm. But through a process of miseducation, we're, we're actually taught to actually work for someone else, to become a good employee. But we aren't taught on how to capitalize on our natural skills, talents, and abilities so that we can create opportunities for ourselves. And that really struck a chord with me. And I started wondering, what is it that I'm naturally good at? And I thought about it, and I've always been very good at organizing, physically organizing different things. And I started doing some research I had no idea that that was an actual profession, being a professional organizer. And I just remember going to an office supply store. I bought some business cards that I could print into my, use my desk jet printer and print up some business cards. (laughs) And I just started going to different events. I would meet people. And I did a lot of bartering when I first started, Deborah. I would, I would, ask people if they had a particular space in their home that they wanted organized. And all I asked for in exchange was a very good testimonial and the ability to be able to take pictures so that I could put those pictures on my website. And also I would ask for uh, a recommendation or a referral to someone else. And so what ended up happening, and I promise I'm speeding through the story now, but I ended up learning or realizing that of of all of the customers that I had at that time, most of them were, were home-based business owners. They were entrepreneurs. And it wasn't that they were chronically disorganized people. That wasn't their issue at all. They just needed systems or processes in place in order to keep things, work and information flowing as seamlessly as possible. Mm. So I started to shift my, my language and my promotional pieces from professional organizing to business infrastructure. And over the years, and this is a key tenant that I would love to share with your, your audience, your, your customers will always tell you what they want. We just have to listen. I would have never, if I had written a business plan, Deborah, from the very beginning, I could not even fathom where this company is today. I just couldn't have even imagined it. But in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing all of this research and I'm going online and I'm finding all of this data. But at the end of the day, it's my customers who tell me exactly what they want. It's my job as the business owner to listen and to act accordingly. And that is the story in a a nutshell of how Equilibria came to be how this thing called business infrastructure came into existence. And I really think it attributes to my success and my ability to have been in business for this long. Mm, It's just listening, right. Listening, just really listening to what people want and, and paying attention to the trends, but still listening to what people want and figuring out a way to constantly tweak the way we deliver our services. Perfect. So that's so, so 17 years on. So tell me about Equilibria now as a business. Equilibria now as a business, most of every, mostly everything that we do is now digital, Deborah. So we've gone from doing everything face to face to everything is pretty much 100% digital. And we were starting to make this transition before COVID. You know how COVID forced so many of us, you know, many of us who may have been resistant to digitization, it it really forced us to to take a look at how we were operating our businesses and how we might be able to deliver our products and services in a more remote type fashion. So Equilibria is fully digital. We have an online course now. We have a team it looks completely different from what it was when I first started out where it was just me and I'm barely getting any sleep every night and just 
just continuing to grow. The team is spread out across the world. Mm -hmm. So I have some, some wonderful people who help me in the Philippines. There's a wonderful team in Nigeria. And I'm starting to also look into some uh, working with a company in Ecuador as well. So it's just really exciting. And we, a lot of our content, we, we are very content focused mm -hmm. um, because so much of this centers around education, Deborah. A, a lot of, I think we were talking before, before we started the recording, it's, it's very difficult to find information as a mid-sized business owner when you are on the cusp of scaling to an even greater height and you're starting to run into some trouble with your back office operations, things are starting to become chaotic. Who do you turn to? What type of consultant do you look for? What type of advice, advice do you seek? What, how do, what do you call it? And so that's why our focus now, Deborah, is so is so heavy on the content side. So the newsletters, the YouTube videos, the podcast interviews, taking advantage of any content platform that's out there so that we can just get the word out mm -hmm. so that we don't so that these mid-sized businesses that are already so successful don't have to become a part of that tragic statistic of companies that fail, not because they don't have enough business, but because they may have too much and they don't have the operational or the business infrastructure to support that growth. Yeah. And I think this is a challenge, isn't it? I mean, the businesses that I work with, they've often been around for some time. They are established. Um, they are doing well, but as they, you know, as they grow quickly, um, things just become more and more complicated. And if they haven't got those systems and processes and infrastructure right, then there is a real challenge because it becomes reliant on um, individual people. And of course, that individual person is no longer available. So, so talk to me through, talk through with me, some of the companies that have come to you and the kind of challenges they've faced and how you've helped them. I can give you a very recent example because I do still work with very large organizations as well, but I'll, I'll focus on another mid-sized business that mm -hmm. just reached out to me a couple of weeks ago. And this poor owner, he's panicking because he's starting to lose a lot of his valuable employees because they're finding jobs elsewhere that are paying them higher salaries. But the business just keeps coming in fast and furious. And we've had a couple of conversations and he said, you know, I've read your book. I listened to the podcast episodes, but we need help. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, one of the first things that I always recommend that people do is this exercise where you document every single activity that you and your team perform from the most mundane to the most complex. And I'm going to give a little demonstration here. I hope you don't mind if that's okay. That's but just, just to give uh, a little visual here. So imagine you have some, some index cards mm -hmm. and you're going to write the name of every single activity that you're performing in your business. So here I'm holding up three sample index cards. One is says C1, A1, and B3. Mm -hmm. This is just representative of different tasks or activities that you and your team are performing in your business. Now, once you've gone through the rigor of brainstorming everything that you all do, including the things that you recognize you should do, but you may not be doing right now, you want to get all of that information onto those different cards. And the next step is to try to get everyone together in the same room at the same time in front of a large table and you're going to spread all of those index cards across that table. And the next thing you'll do is you'll start to group all of the tasks that are similar in nature into columns. So here I'm, I'm holding up three cards now. Each starts with the letter A. So if I have this particular column of cards on the table, and then I look at my team and my team and I were starting to brainstorm and we will have a conversation about, ideally, if we had to associate all the activities grouped in this column where everything starts with the letter A, what would we call the name of that department? Well, 
we'll call it department A. And so you'll keep going through this exercise until you've identified hopefully no more than about nine departments, but then you want to go through the next really fun exercise, which is my favorite part, <laughs> is I have a little stick figure here and it has CEO written across it. And what you'll do next, Deborah, and for anyone who's listening, so you'll look at each department in isolation of the other departments. So right now I'm holding up department A. I have task A2. Now, someone may say, well, I'm currently, as CEO, I'm currently performing this task. But it's important for you and your team to have a serious conversation about whether or not you ideally are the best person to perform that task. What if it's really an office manager or a, di a director of some sort, a VP, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. you want to get into the practice of identifying in a perfect world, if you had access to all of the resources that you needed, who ideally should perform all of these different activities. And it's so eye-opening. So with going back to this, this, this business owner who contacted me a couple of weeks ago, he was, he called me just a couple of days ago, actually, so excited because he and his team were starting to go through this exercise and he's a light bulb went off for him. And he said, oh my goodness, I never realized how much all of us were, we're, were doing the work of three to four, three to five different people, like each of us. Mm -hmm. This is crazy. No wonder we're all so stressed out and the, the anxiety is high. It's, it's such a stressful environment because we're overworked. Well, now he's identified all of the additional roles or positions and it's giving him a plan of action. Obviously you can't go and expect to hire or fill all of those positions at one time, but now they have a plan. Mm. Okay, within the next 12 months, based on our sales forecast, I think it's realistic. I think it's realistically, we can at least fill two of maybe these six positions that we've identified that are still vacant. So it's, it's a very visual way and an and elementary way for you to quickly get to the, the crux of what makes your business work. What does it really look like on the inside? Knowing your activities and how they're organized into departments is so empowering because that literally serves as a foundation for how you organize your paper files, your digital records, how you come up with your organizational chart and your processes. Yep. So now that you know all of those activities associated with, with each department, you can then start to carve out the different processes that need to be documented per department. Mm. So this is just a, a really quick demo of the exercises that I go through with clients and the exercises that are detailed in my book. I use a lot of analog tools, which shocks a lot of people, <laughs> but it's so effective yeah. because can you imagine getting onto a, a Zoom call with your team and you, you say you're going to have a brainstorming exercise and you're all just kind of sitting there and <laughs> again, <yeah. laughs> right? like, do we have to go through this again? And it's just challenging, honestly, sitting in front of a computer for up to you know four hours. You could easily spend four hours, if not more doing an, an exercise like this. But when you're in the same room at the mm -hmm. same time and you have these large post-it notes, you're writing things out, you have these index cards and then people get to work together to actually group things you know, according to similarity, you would be amazed at the conversations that you will have that you may have never had before. And another thing is, so many, so much information is revealed. Uh, you may realize just how siloed your company is, is working, mm -hmm. where the left hand may not realize what the right hand is doing, but by having everyone in the room at the same time, and they're involved, actively involved in carving out the departments of the company and, and, and really getting crystal clear on what the company looks like on the inside. Now, Deborah, when it comes to implementing any type of change, you better believe that they're going to be advocates because they've been there in the trenches with you 
actually figuring all of this out. So they have a vested interest in making sure that it works now, rather than you just kind of working alone in your office, you come up with something and then you email it out to everyone and you expect them to follow it. Yeah. So, um, so I just thought I'd share that. Um, it's, it's a really fun thing that I do. And these stick figures are laminated because oh, yeah. <laughs> as you're having conversations, you know, you may say, wait a minute, this shouldn't be me. You know, I shouldn't be doing this as the CEO. Let me, let me just erase that. It should really be someone else. I love it. And it's, it's actually a little bit, I mean, as you know, I'm an EOS implementer and we had the same exactly. kind of thing because we talk about, you know, the vision and the core values and the core focus. And often the owner will say, yeah, but I know all of that. It's like, yeah, but you've got to bring your team on that journey as well. And so actually getting in a room and having those discussions, we often don't end up that far away from what the founder originally envisaged. However, um, just by having the input from the team, things do get tweaked, things get picked up that have never been picked up before. And I just think it's yeah getting in a room is, is is so powerful but of course the process component is really important for us as well and, I, and I'm loving this idea because often people go oh, okay we know that we have to um, you know systemize and document our process but how do we do that and I love I, I have this vision now this big table that's full of, of index cards and, and yet, as you said <laughs> becoming aware of how many there actually are and what is really going on and that aha moment of hold on a second, I'm the CEO or the founder or the vision, whatever it is, and I'm doing the the office work, you know, that, that makes yes. zero sense. And, and we know that we're doing <laughs> stuff that we don't like. You're actually in a, a negative kind of um, headspace as well. So the more that you're not working in your unique ability, God-given talent, whatever you want to call it, the more challenging it is for you. You're not in flow. You're not enjoying it. That's That's so true. And Speaking of EOS, for your listeners, definitely look in, into all of the books. I, I have a good friend here, Linda Martin. She's an EOS oh, yes. implementer as I well. Yeah. So I'm familiar. Oh, you, you know, Linda? I do. We're, we're quite a tight community. Oh, so we, we meet oh, every awesome. quarter. So we actually all know each other. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Linda. I've known Linda. Oh, my gosh. Almost since I've lived here in Atlanta. Wonderful woman. That's how I first learned about EOS. And so I'm familiar with the books. And, yeah. and yes, we we are all kind of banding around this idea of getting your operations in place. You know, that's what EOS stands for, right? The yeah. entrepreneurial operating yeah. system. So it's, it's not, a, it's, it's good to focus on the sales and the marketing. Obviously, that's very important. But at some point, you have to start focusing on the operational side as well. Absolutely. In fact, we always say that, you know, you've got to you've got to sell stuff, you've got to make stuff, and then you've got to get the money for stuff. And if you don't have those three things sorted, um, the wheels will fall off no matter which one, you know, if you've only got two out of three, it's not going to work. So it's really important. So tell me about some of the common sort of pitfalls. Where do people fall over? Where do things start to go wrong? Uh, in the process of growing quickly or yeah. in the process? Both. I, I know what you're going to say. So, yeah, the process of growing quickly, but also in terms of, you know, not being able to keep up with their uh, business infrastructure. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you a, a common thing that I see is people wanting results overnight mm -hmm. or rapid mm -hmm. results. Yep. And I, I, I understand, you know, this, this whole idea of instant gratification, but you know what I often, what I always tell them, Deborah, whenever someone says, you know, I want this done and, you know, within the next month and I, I'm, I look at them and I say, well, you didn't build your business in less than a month, right? So why do you think you're going to fix it mm -hmm. in less than a month? You have to be in this for the long game. But what I have learned is that rather than approaching it as this one big, massive effort, try to break it up into smaller, more digestible pieces, because that way you feel a sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So I'm also a, an advocate of the agile method of project management. You know, I know a lot of the software development companies uh, adopt that method as well, um, just so you can have a sense of accomplishment. But I think also another pitfall is, is thinking that it's static. It's not static. It is very much dynamic. So don't think that just because, oh, well, we've identified all of our activities, we know our departments, we know the people who perform the activity, we're done. We're done, Deborah. And we put it off on a nice, you know, we, we 
print it out, it's nice and pretty, or we we distribute it through email or or you know whatever systems that we're using uh, to share information remotely, and we walk away from it. But mm-hmm. these are living, breathing documents, and they have to constantly be updated and constantly be evaluated. I would say look at it at least twice a year mm-hmm. once you once you've really put it in place just to evaluate, does this still make sense? Because the world is constantly changing around us. So what you came up, think about all of us who started off the year 2020 (laughs) with all of these plans that we had for 2020. Mm -hmm. And then (laughs) COVID comes along and we're like, okay, um, (laughs) we have to probably change most, if not all, of what we originally planned for this year. So that's why I think it's so important to just, you know, remind yourself this is this is dynamic. It's not static. It's not intended to be done one time and then you walk away from it and you never to revisit it again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, another personal mantra I know at the beginning of the interview, you did ask me. Um, kind of like what's something that I uh, almost like a creed yeah. uh, but m- my personal mantra and professional I guess too is leave it better than you found it. it you know sometimes we can be extra hard on ourselves too so this is another pitfall that I see of, of business owners is really beating up on themselves you know I should have known better I should have done this I should have done that you know sometimes you don't know what you don't know Mm-hmm. And don't, don't be so hard on yourself. Take the lessons, be grateful when you do meet people like Deborah and they intro, you know, and Deborah introduces you to EOS. Don't beat yourself up or ask yourself, why didn't I think to search for something like that years ago? And I, I could have met Deborah years ago instead of right now in 2022. Just everything happens for a reason. And just just be grateful that you now have the people you're attracting the people that you need or the the, the different types of resources the different books the the websites the webinars the workshops whatever it is whatever knowledge it is that you need to help you start making some some critical decisions that may need to be made in your company mm-hmm. Well, I agree. That's fantastic. Hey, look, I, I'm really conscious of time. We could talk forever about this. And I have to say, in all honesty, this makes the process component now so much more exciting because I think often people kind of go, oh gosh, systems and processes. We hate that. You know, we don't want to do it. But I, I think the way that you describe it, it's got me kind of going, oh, I want to go get some bits of paper and put them on the back of things. So I'm sure the readers will find that too. Now you've mentioned that you've actually written a book. Can you tell us a little bit more about that book? Oh, sure. Thank you so much for for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. It's called Behind the Facade, How to Structure Company Operations for Sustainable Success. You can't miss it. It's a green book. It has a lion on the front and on the front cover is this lion. He's on a stage and there's a spotlight shining on him. And the question that's posed on the front cover is, is your business ready for the spotlight? In other words, imagine if you had that one viral moment, you were on a particular TV show or a podcast interview, a radio interview, and all of a sudden you have all of this business coming your way, would you be able to handle it? And so what's cool about the book is when you flip it over to the back, on the back cover, it's just a little cub (laughs) behind the stage, behind the curtain. And and the, the whole idea is, there's nothing wrong with erecting a facade. You know, you, you have to put forth your best effort to attract the customers that you hope to attract. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that at all. All I'm suggesting is make sure that your business look operates as good on the inside as it looks on the outside. So that's what the book is all about. It talks all about the stick figures and the index cards. It goes through great detail about how to perform all of those exercises, but it tells it in the form of stories. So these are stories that I I hope your audience, if they would 
uh, be so inclined as to check out the book, you would definitely find a story that you would relate to. I'm a big, a big fan girl of Patrick Lencioni, and that's because I love the way that he tells stories. For me, when you tell a story, mm. it's so much easier um, to get your head around how that works. And so that's great. Okay, so what about three top tips for the listeners? What would be the three things you'd love to share, uh, either based on things that you've learned or, or tools that you could um, introduce them to? So I have two sets. Yep. One is the D's, the three D's, document, delegate, digitize. Document, delegate, digitize. The other set are the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Read something every day to continue yep. to perfect your craft. Don't ever become comfortable in what you already know. There's always something new to learn. Write something every day. I know, Deborah, you have your LinkedIn newsletter. You have all of these amazing materials, but, but that's how you, again, continue to perfect your craft and get your message out about whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. And then arithmetic, measure, write, you know, do the calculations. What are some of those key numbers that you need to look at? Maybe not every day, but at least once a week to really let you know the health of your company. Mm -hmm. So those are my tips. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. And if people want to get hold of your book, um, where would they find that? Is that on Amazon is the easiest way? It or? is on it is on Amazon. You can yeah. also go to my personal website, which is Alicia Butler Pierre.com. And when you get there, you'll see a link to the book, my company, um, all of my social handles. So anything that you might want to know about me, you will probably find on that website. Great. We'll put that link in the podcast thing as well. And I believe you said at the beginning, you've got a special offer for the listeners as well. I do. I do. So if you enjoy that, the, the little bit that we've shared today on, on Deborah's podcast about the stick figures and the index cars, and maybe if you want to hear the stories that we mentioned uh, in the book, we actually have it in an audio format. So there is a free audio masterclass called the Smooth Operator Masterclass. Ah. And if you go to smoothoperator.courses, all you have to do is provide your first name, your email address, and you will start to receive links to these free audio episodes. And it will go into great detail about how to perform these different exercises. Oh, that is fantastic. So I'm getting myself a book and I'm going to go and listen to that as well. So <laughs> thank <laughs> you. Say, I've, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. Say, it's it, to be, to be perfectly frank, I myself sometimes struggle with that processing. I'm much more of a visionary. And so we get to the process components like, oh, really, do I have to do that? But now I'm getting quite excited about it. So I'm going to get the book. We're going to have a look oh, at it. I'm going to sit down with my integrator and go, how can we actually do some of this ourselves, make it a bit easier? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you so, so much for your time. I know uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. I know we had a couple of little hiccups in terms of getting here and I messed up on the times, but really appreciate everything that you've shared. Love talking to you. Hey, if somebody wants to get in contact with you personally, can they do that through the website as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Or in, in social media as well. Of Definitely. Course. Yeah. Hey, look, um, I'm sure people will do that. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so, so much. I look forward to keeping in contact and chatting again soon. Oh, definitely. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, thanks very much, Alicia.